Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on from when and where you're joining us. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC's Public Health Grand Rounds for March 2018, the global introduction of new vaccines, delivering more to more. We have an exciting session, so let's get started, but first a few housekeeping slides. Public Health Grand Rounds has continuing education available, and we are pleased to announce CDC's new continuing education website at cdc.gov slash getce. Please see our website or theirs for more details. Grand Rounds is available on the web and all your favorite social media sites. Please send questions about today's session to us at grandrounds at cdc.gov. Want to know more? We have a featured video segment at our website called Beyond the Data, which is posted after the session. This month's segment features my interview with Dr. Mantel. We also have partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles introducing new vaccines globally. The full listing is available at cdc.gov slash science clips. Here is a preview of our upcoming Grand Round topics. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. In addition to our outstanding speakers, Dr. Lohari Kar, Mantel, and Burgess, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the important contributions of the individuals listed here. Thank you. And now for a few words from CDC's Acting Director, Dr. Shuket. Hello, and welcome to today's Grand Rounds, Global Introduction of New Vaccines, Delivering More to More. There are now licensed vaccines to prevent literally dozens of infectious diseases, including certain types of cancer. Illnesses that once kept parents awake at night in wealthier communities could be fatal for malnourished children. Broader access to effective vaccines against the most feared or common illnesses, measles, rotavirus gastroenteritis, and pneumonia, are now routine in most countries. The large number of newer vaccines brings great opportunity to reduce illness and death. At the same time, it challenges governments to find the most effective and efficient ways to make these advances available to everyone. Despite substantial progress in the 21st century, inequity in vaccine access remains a challenge. Many unvaccinated people live in urban slums or remote rural areas. In some countries, a child from a rich family is nine times more likely than a poor child to get the basic vaccines. These inequities require tailored strategies to reach that fifth child, one of the more than 20% of children who receives no vaccines at all. Humanitarian emergencies and insecure areas also create inequity and require a different approach to ensuring the vaccination of all children. Through continued efforts with partners, we work to reduce inequities and to ensure we reach those most in need. Thank you, Dr. Shuket. And now for our first speaker, Dr. Lo Harikar. The World Health Organization initiated the Expanded Program on Immunization, or EPI, in 1974 with the goal of providing universal immunization for essential vaccines. The first six vaccine-preventable diseases targeted with vaccination were diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, poliomyelitis, and tuberculosis. Following the initiation of the WHO EPI program, we saw a substantial reduction in the burden of preventable childhood illnesses and deaths. This figure shows a decline in global measles cases between 1980 to 2012, with a rapid increase in coverage of measles vaccine. Despite these successes, however, almost a quarter of under five child mortality is attributable to vaccine-preventable diseases. Since the 1980s, there have been significant advances made in the development and introduction of new vaccines. Now, there are vaccines available to protect against 25 infectious diseases. In today's three presentations, we will be focusing on the progress and challenges with new vaccine introduction. 
So what is a new vaccine? Broadly, new vaccines refer to those available after the first six initial vaccines targeted by WHO. This is an evolving definition and differs by country, as a vaccine is really new for a country when it has not been introduced yet. Once a vaccine is introduced and being used routinely, it is no longer new for that country. Some new vaccines are universally recommended for introduction in all countries, for example, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine or rotavirus vaccine. Some vaccines are recommended for targeted use. For example, yellow fever or Japanese encephalitis are recommended in highly endemic regions of the world. Others are recommended for targeted use like outbreaks like cholera or Ebola or specific circumstances like rabies vaccine. With the availability and introduction of more new vaccines, we can dramatically reduce child mortality from vaccine-preventable diseases. Furthermore, vaccines are important to prevent and control outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases, not only within a country, but across borders, a key component of epidemic preparedness. Vaccines are a critical step in elimination and eradication of vaccine-preventable diseases. This was seen with smallpox in the past, and now we are closer than ever to polio eradication. And there are already focused efforts on measles elimination. Introduction of new vaccines is one of the key solutions to respond to rapidly increasing antimicrobial resistance. 2011 to 2020 has been deemed the decade of vaccines with the development of the Global Vaccine Action Plan, or GVAP. This comprehensive document was put together by many countries, governmental and non-governmental organizations, and international partners with a vision for a world free from vaccine-preventable diseases. The GVAP identified six key progress indicators to measure success, which are shown here. The final GVAP target is for vaccine introduction, requiring that 90 low or middle income countries have introduced one or more new or underutilized vaccines since 2010. Importantly, this is the only target that has been achieved. This target of new vaccine introduction has been met and exceeded as shown in the, the figure. Since 2010, 193 vaccine introductions have occurred in 108 out of 138 low- and middle-income countries. This figure shows the progress in introducing six new vaccines by countries between 2000 and 2016. The arrows point to Haemophilus influenza type B, or Hib, in red, and Hepatitis B in green, which have gradually increased to now include almost all countries. Introduction of rubella vaccine, shown in dark blue, plateaued until recent global efforts to really promote this vaccine. Inactivated polio vaccine, or IPV, in light purple, had gradually increased until 2013. But due to extensive global efforts for polio eradication, including global mandates for its introduction, use of IPV has dramatically risen. Pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV, is shown in blue, and rotavirus vaccine in dark red. PCV has shown more rapid progress in introductions, while rotavirus vaccine is trailing slightly behind, and my colleague Dr. Mantel will discuss this in more detail. Vaccination against Hib has been one of the major global health achievements in the past 30 years. Almost now, almost all countries have introduced Hib vaccine. And this figure shows an impressive decline in the invasive Hib disease in children under five in a region in Kenya, which has had ongoing disease surveillance since the late 1990s. 137 countries have introduced PCV as of January this year. Recent introductions have occurred in high burden areas in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Ongoing disease surveillance in the Gambia shows dramatic reductions in incidence of pneumococcal pneumonia and hypoxic pneumonia following the introduction of PCV. Almost half of countries have introduced rotavirus vaccine, including many countries in Africa, but it has not yet been widely introduced in Asia. This surveillance study from four countries in Africa shows a decline in rotavirus-positive diarrhea hospitalizations among children under five in yellow, with an increasing vaccine coverage in green. 
This figure from disease surveillance in Mexico highlights impressive reduction in all-cause diarrheal death following rotavirus vaccine introduction. Human papillomavirus, or HPV, vaccine has been introduced in 40% of countries, mostly in the Americas, Europe, and Australia. It is now starting to be introduced in low- and middle-income countries, which have 85% of the world's mortality from HPV-associated cervical cancer. Data from the United States show substantial decline in prevalence of HPV type 6, 11, 16, and 18 within the first four years after HPV vaccine introduction and further decreases in the following four years. The tremendous progress in new vaccine introduction is largely due to the efforts of multiple global partners and donors in the past two to three decades. And some key partners and their roles are listed here. WHO evaluates vaccines for acceptability, safety, and effectiveness as part of a process for vaccine prequalification. This is particularly important for low-income countries that do not have their own regulatory system. WHO also provides global recommendations and policies for vaccine introduction and implementation. UNICEF leads the development of communication and social mobilization materials, as well as plays a key role in vaccine procurement from manufacturers for low-income countries. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, provides donor funding for eligible countries. Eligibility is determined by the country's gross national income. Gavi, along with other donors, plays a key role in vaccine market shaping through forecasting and assuring demand. By 2020, it is estimated that all or nearly all Gavi-eligible countries are projected to have introduced the following nine new vaccines wherever they are recommended. It is estimated that over 23 million deaths will be averted from vaccines during 2011 to 2020 in 73 Gavi-eligible countries. There are multiple levels at which vaccine decision-making and policies are made. This figure briefly shows three levels from global to regional to national or country level. At the global level, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, reviews the disease burden, clinical trial data, and vaccine safety evidence to set global policy recommendations for vaccines. These policy statements are then published in the WHO epidemiologic record. At the regional level, the Regional Immunization Technical Advisory Group, or RITAG, identifies regional priorities and uses SAGE global policy to set regional policies and strategies. At the country level, the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, or NITAG, reviews guidance from SAGE from the region and along with other country priorities and makes immunization recommendations to the national health authorities. There are many global factors that can influence the timing and prioritization of new vaccine introduction, apart from the routine WHO framework described in the previous slide. First, vaccine introduction is highly dependent on vaccine supply, security, and procurement. There have been recent supply shortages of rotavirus, PCV, IPV, and HPV vaccines. This can be due to the limited number of manufacturers, increasing demand, and inaccurate supply forecasting at times. Some countries are utilizing programmatic modifications to address supply constraints in a time of urgent need. For example, using fractional doses of vaccines or phased introductions. Increasing van man vaccine manufacturing in middle-income countries can reduce the price of vaccines and increase available supply. There have been extensive global efforts for polio eradication, including global mandates, which can greatly facilitate and promote vaccine introduction. After 2013, there was a global mandate to introduce IPV, and we saw, a dr we saw dramatic increases in IPV introduction globally. In 2016, there was a global mandate for all countries using oral polio vaccines to switch from trivalent to bivalent OPV during a short two-week period. This has been an unprecedented and truly remarkable achievement of the countries around the globe as part of the endgame for polio eradication. 
Regional or global outbreaks of new or emerging vaccine-preventable diseases can impact immunization services and vaccine introduction. Areas with outbreaks require additional resources for vaccination campaigns. This was recently seen in cholera outbreaks in Haiti, Zambia, and Yemen, or yellow fever in Angola or Brazil. Outbreaks may necessitate the use of pre-licensure vaccines, as seen with Ebola in West Africa. Outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases can and frequently do occur during a hum humanitarian crisis, particularly when people are living in a crowded, unsanitary condition like a refugee camp. As recently experienced with the diphtheria and cholera outbreaks among the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. This photo shows a recent oral cholera vaccine campaign in Bangladesh. Increasing antimicrobial resistance necessitates global support for new vaccine introduction. PCV introduction is a good example of success when facing increasing antimicrobial resistance. Introduction of PCV has prevented resistant infections and led to the reduction in antibiotic use. A newer typhoid conjugate vaccine is now available. It has recently been pre-qualified by WHO in January this year, and Gavi endorsed funding support for eligible countries. This vaccine has a potential for high impact on prevention and control of antimicrobial resistant typhoid fever. It is currently being used to control an extensively drug-resistant typhoid outbreak in Pakistan. There are several additional new vaccines across the lifespan that we have not discussed today. These are shown here in the boxes for infants and young children, older children and adolescents, pregnant women, and older adults. The vaccines in black have been developed and are currently in varying stages of introduction. The vaccines shown in blue are next in the pipeline and currently in varying stages of development and the regulatory process. We have seen extensive progress in introducing new vaccines in low and lower middle income countries, meeting and exceeding the GVAP vaccine introduction target. This is largely due to the support of multiple international partners and donors. New vaccine introductions have demonstrated significant reduction in vaccine-preventable disease burden and mortality. Decision-making on vaccine introduction is a complex process and can be influenced by other global factors, including vaccine supply, global mandates, outbreaks and humanitarian crises, and increasing antimicrobial resistance patterns. There is a need for continued support at the global level for new vaccine introduction and implementation to sustain the health gains already made and work towards the remaining GVAP targets. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Mantel. So we just learned about the GVAP, the Global Vaccine Action Plan, whose mission is to extend by 2020 and beyond the full benefits of immunization to all people, regardless of where they're born, who they are, or where they live, and as such upholding a major focus on equitable delivery. However, in, in spite of the success of new vaccine introductions that we just heard, the equitable coverage with these vaccines is still a, pro a problem across the globe. Nearly one in 10 infants has not received any vaccine, as reflected in the diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, first dose coverage. And almost a fifth of all children are still not receiving all doses of DPT. The main global immunization coverage indicator, DTP3, is stagnating at around 86% for the last few years. And we know that most of the unvaccinated children actually live in 10 large countries. And this is where the efforts of the global immunization community now need to be concentrated. Other <clears throat> inter-country inequities are exemplified by the slow introduction of rotavirus vaccines in Asia that we just heard of. And global inequity is further evidenced by the low PCV uptake in middle-income countries, which are lagging behind high-income countries and the Gavi-supported low-income countries. And we'll see that in a minute. Here we see the changes in the number of children who failed to receive DTP3, so the third dose of diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine in the 10 countries with the most unvaccinated children that are listed here. 
While progress is being made in some of the countries, as you can see, most clearly in India, which happens to also have the largest number of vaccinated children of all countries, and also in Ethiopia and in DRC, there is stagnation and even sometimes an increase in the number of unvaccinated in the other countries, such as in Nigeria, in Angola, and in Brazil. This map, which we saw before, showing the rotavirus vaccine introductions in 2017, demonstrates the delay in the vaccine use in Asia and in parts of Eastern Europe. While almost all the countries in the Americas and many other parts of the world have made great strides in implementing this vaccine. Let's have a look at the challenge for the middle-income countries. Today, more than two-thirds of the world poor actually live in these countries, in the middle-income countries, not in the low-income countries. The proportion of the birth cohort without access to new vaccines is higher there than in the low or in the high-income countries. And importantly, about one quarter of the vaccine-preventable deaths today occur in middle-income countries, which are excluded from Gavi support or are about to lose that support because their GNI per capita is higher than the Gavi cutoff of 1,580 US dollars per capita. Now this graph illustrates that middle-income countries are lagging behind in new vaccine introduction, again exemplified by the PCV uptake here, as shown in the solid yellow line. The factors responsible for this include the non-availability of scientific evidence, decision-making processes, complex regulatory processes, vaccine pricing and procurement, and importantly, the unaffordability in view of inadequate domestic immunization budgets. But inequities in vaccine use do not only exist between, but also within countries. Conflicts and humanitarian emergencies jeopardize immunization performance, as presently seen, for instance, in Syria and Yemen. But even without overt conflicts, we find inequities in vaccine use between urban and rural populations, with coverage in urban slum populations often as low as in remote rural communities, and between settled and nomadic populations or between ethnic majorities and minorities. There's substantial inequity in vaccination coverage by economic and educational status, and the latter mostly driven by mother's education. Interestingly, we see relatively little differential between sexes, although there is lower tetanus toxoid immunity among older males. Vaccine hesitancy has been increasing in recent years, as we all know, mostly in better off and potentially well-informed communities, and leading to reduced vaccine uptake, sometimes resulting in outbreaks, for instance, of measles, arising from often misinformed convictions and beliefs. Here's a preliminary scenario based on projected proportions of unimmunized children in rural and urban areas. And as you can see, 44% of the under-immunized children in those top 10 countries, with more than 50% of the under-immunized children in 2016, now live in urban areas, an area that we often have neglected so far. And these are the yellow areas of the pie. And almost every fifth unimmunized child lives in slums depicted by the dark yellow up there. As seen here, and as we heard from Anne Schuchert, inequalities in vaccine coverage, and here is again our DTP3 uh, indicator by wealth quintiles, can reach enormous dimensions. Uh, as you can see here with a child from a rich family, up to nine times more likely to be vaccinated than a child from a poor family. So what is being done to reduce these inequities? At the global level, there is a renewed focus on equity and immunization initiated by the Global Vaccine Action Plan and taken up by Gavi and the Global Immunization Alliance partners. At the country level, in many situations, governments may be limited in reaching community-based, in reaching underserved populations. So in recent years, community-based organizations have stepped up their involvement in global immunization, including in new vaccine introduction and developed locally adapted solutions to increase coverage to recreate trust in immunization services where it had waned, and to increase the locally adapted use of new vaccines, often integrate in immunization with other health interventions. And in, in very insecure areas, new approaches used to deliver a maximum number of antigens in a short period of time, and the use of community volunteers 
proved successful to raise coverage there. So in line with the GVAP, Gavi has prominently placed equitable uptake and coverage as the primary goal of its present strategy, as you can see here in the yellow circle. And with regards to middle-income countries, WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, the Gates Foundation, and others, as part of the Middle-Income Country Task Force, have developed a strategy addressing a number of specific issues important to sustainably reach the underserved populations in these countries, such as decision-making, political commitment, financial sustainability, enhanced demand, equitable delivery, and affordable and timely procurement and supply. Important efforts were also made to better understand vaccine hesitancy and refusal, often based on safety concerns and to take appropriate and locally adapted measures to recreate and increase trust in vaccines and improve uptake in specific communities. Available materials provide checklists for planning, communication, advocacy with new vaccine introductions in this context, taking into account the variety of the issues listed here. And the tailoring immunization programs tool uh, helps to identify and prioritize vaccine hesitant populations and subgroups to diagnose the demand and supply side barriers to vaccination in these populations and design responses to vaccine hesitancy, which is appropriate to the setting, the context, and the specific population. Beyond these approaches, there are also more technical solutions to improve the reach of vaccines. For instance, thermostable vaccines could increase the use of vaccines in outreach services, not necessitating a complex cold chain. A reduced packaging enables more vaccines to be taken to remote and difficult locations. And more innovative delivery technology will likely soon allow vaccine administration by placing a vaccine microarray patch on the arm of a, of a child, as depicted here, rather than by using syringe and needles thus also enabling less well-trained health workers to administer parenteral vaccines. Here's an illustration of the tenfold reduction in rotavirus vaccine packaging between the first and the third generation vaccine presentation, drastically reducing the stress on vaccine supply chains. And the new delivery technologies depicted here include blowfield seal containers up left, uh, intradermal devices enabling fractional doses to be administered uh, in the skin, compact pre-filled injection devices on the lower left, and then several types of microarray patches, all of which are intended to improve vaccination coverage and reach. Gavi and Alliance partners have recently also launched a cold chain equipment optimization platform to enable countries to further modernize their cold chains and logistics capacity with high-performing standardized equipment, a vital building block towards delivering vaccines more equitably. And a much debated question in the immunization community was related to the perceived divide between routine and new vaccines and the fear of a negative effect of rout on routine vaccination services by introducing too many new vaccines. I think today there is ample evidence showing that the introduction of new and more costly vaccines have actually strengthened routine immunization in a number of ways. The increased focus on immunization provided additional advocacy and visibility. Opportunities were created for initiating change in routine practices. New vaccines brought about enhanced training opportunities. Vaccine management was improved, as we just heard. Uh, much has been invested in improved data quality and better collection, recording and reporting of immunization data. And this includes VPD surveillance and improved uh, adverse event following immunization reporting and management. So while inequities due to geography, wealth, educational status are being tackled with a renewed emphasis generated by the new vaccine introductions, an additional approach was also strengthened by new vaccines. The extension of immunization from infant vaccination to a life course approach. With many war, more vaccines in the schedule, EPI services now need to deliver not only birth doses and infant vaccines in the EPI, but expand these services into the second year of life and beyond. Going forward, it is envisaged that regular child health visits will be implemented, during which all vaccines according to the age of the child or the person are administered in conjunction with other health interventions, which should be delivered at the same age. 
At the same time, new platforms for vaccine delivery will need to be further developed, such as antenatal services, school-based delivery, adolescent health programs, as well as targeted service for people like myself, the elderly, and for specific <laughs> patient groups in, in need of, of certain vaccines, such as diabetics, for instance. And finally, missed opportunities for vaccination will have to be reduced. This could quite easily be done by just checking the immunization status of all children and of patients of other age groups whenever they access the health services. Recent work by our colleague Ike Ogbuanu and uh, others have shown that coverage increases of 10% and more can be achieved with relatively simple measures. This, of course, will also be true in the reverse I, by checking the need for other preventive interventions when clients show up for vaccination. Here's an example of the team's recent work. Chat on the left-hand side with 43% of eligible children leaving health facilities unvaccinated. In Burkina Faso, this is even up to 80%. Chat did a quick evaluation and initiated missed opportunities of vaccination strategy. And this chart shows that in two participating districts in July and August last year, depicted in the light blue bars, implementation of a strategy using cross-referral simple vouchers, led to a sizable increase in the number of vaccinated kids, shown in the dark blue bars, compared to the same month in the year before in light blue and the earlier month of the same year in dark blue on the left. So, such integration of health services should be further pursued, but it will need to be done wisely and care taken not to over-integrate. Given the relatively high coverage rates of immunization programs, 86%, we saw attempts to overload the CAMEL EPI by adding too many additional interventions, such as those listed here, to sometimes already strained EPI services. So going forward, it will be beneficial to improve coordination and collaboration between immunization and other preventive and curative services to generate caravans of programs marching in the same direction towards the common goal of improving the health of their target populations. And with this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Burgess for the third talk. Thank you. When it comes to making investment decisions in health, vaccines are a very attractive option. They not only provide return on investment in terms of decreased mortality and morbidity, they also make sound economic sense. For example, for every dollar invested in immunization, there is payback of $16 if you take into consideration the costs associated with illness and lost productivity, and $44 if you take into consideration the costs associated with broader economic impacts, such as cognitive development or loss of earnings. The new vaccines against pneumonia and rotavirus, two major causes of um, child mortality and morbidity, contribute significantly to this investment. You'd also see um, in the graphic on the left-hand side that investment in immunization is favorable when compared to other investment choices, such as public infrastructure or even cardiovascular research. Vaccines are very cost-effective um, with most traditional and new vaccines costing less than $100 per DALI and less than three times gross domestic product per capita. These are two key measures for decision policymakers when making investment decisions. However, use of cost effectiveness data needs to be interpreted based on local context, including local disease burden patterns and vaccine delivery systems' ability to reach those who need vaccines the most. And this can vary greatly between countries and within countries. So overall, vaccines are an attractive investment when devising essential health packages, as they are often more cost-effective than other basic curative or preventive health interventions. Deciding on whether to introduce new vaccines into a national schedule is complex, and it requires an understanding of the context and the stakeholders involved and their influences on the process. They include those with technical, legislative, and implementation aspects of the program. 
On the left side of the graphic, you can see various stakeholders from, as we've heard before, global level SAGE policy making body to the National Immunization Technical Advisory Groups, which help set the technical directions, to the Ministry of Health, WHO, UNICEF, and other partners in the National Immunization Interagency Coordination Committee. They all play a key role. Technical recommendations are often considered by political bodies within the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance or Cabinet before decisions are made. Private sector companies and practitioners can influence decision making at different times. One often neglected group of stakeholders who have the weakest voice are the ultimate beneficiaries, the women and children living in the poorest communities. These groups may or may not be represented through civil society efforts. Not all decisions are made at national level, and there are many examples, including Indonesia and India, where some decisions are made at district or province level, and there may be sub-national differences on how vaccines are used or even budgeted for. And views on financial and technical sustainability and what is sustainable may differ between the different stakeholders considerably which impacts on the decision on new vaccine introduction. Decisions on whether to introduce new vaccines into a national program include, on the one side, political and technical factors, which may include vaccine safety, effectiveness, the burden of disease, other political and health priorities, and the economic and financial issues. And once a new vaccine introduction can be justified from a technical point of view, other considerations revolve around the feasibility and scheduling, for example, which may be include availability of vaccine supply, the characteristics of the vaccine presentation, and the vaccine program performance, i.e. the ability of the systems to absorb and equitably deliver new vaccines sustainably. New vaccines also need to fit into essential health packages, integrated delivery platforms, and broader planning and budgeting processes beyond immunization. To make all these decisions, there is a need for much evidence on economics, disease burden, delivery, and cold chain. Knowing how decisions are made in a Ministry of Health is important, especially in knowing where, especially in knowing um, where, when, and how plans and budgets, budgets are made. Like any policy decisions, there are considerable compromises and trade-offs that need to be made. So, for example, deciding to invest in a new vaccine may mean another aspect of healthcare or other vaccine is not invested in. Like any decision, communicating the results and opportunities is important to raise awareness and demand for vaccine products and also decrease vaccine resistance. Vaccine prices are the main cost driver in immunization programs. And most of the increasing cost is driven by the increasing number of vaccines and the higher price of new vaccines. For example, in 2001, the six initial antigens, that's oral polio, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, measles, and BCG, all cost around 67 cents. By 2014, with 11 antigens, those are the initial ones I just named, plus hepatitis B, pneumonia coccal, uh, pneumococcal vaccine, rubella, rotavirus, and injectable polio vaccine instead of oral polio vaccine, cost $32.09 to fully immunize a boy. And if we include HPV as well to fully immunize a girl, it costs $45.59. This reflects an increase of 68 times for vaccine costs alone, not including delivery costs between 2001 and 2014. Vaccines do not deliver themselves, as we've heard, and delivery mechanisms also cost money and take time too, if the investment in vaccines is to be maximized. There are increased costs associated with reaching more children, and the cost, uh, and the cost per child immunized generally increases as coverage increases. In other words, it costs more per child to go from 95 to 96 percent than from 50 to 51 percent coverage, as these children often live in harder to reach contexts. There is also increasing use of campaigns to deliver new vaccines, especially where coverage needs to be raised quickly. 
However, delivery of vaccines through campaigns often cost more and are less sustainable than through routine programs. Investing in delivery systems is crucial if vaccines are to reach those who need the vaccines the most, those with the greatest disease burden, this is an argument in favour of equity, to maximise vaccines' cost-effectiveness and also to protect the considerable investment in vaccines themselves through support for cold chain and supply chains, for example. Investing in delivery vaccine mechanisms requires significant resources, and after vaccines themselves, the main cost driver of immunisation programmes are systems related. From work by the finance group in the Decade of Vaccines Working Group, you can see in the pie chart that it is estimated that 63% of systems costs are service delivery related, 41% being for human resources, 15% for program management. And 37% of system costs are related to supply and cold chain logistics, with 23% cold chain equipment and overheads, and 9% for vehicles and transport. Many of these are shared costs with other programs that require intensive coordination. Getting evidence and sources for costing is important, as estimates help generate budget and advocate for resources. The more accurate these estimates are, the better. Costing an immunisation programme can be complex and needs a thorough understanding of how budgets and costs are used and made for the broader health sector, primary health care, and implementing strategies such as reaching every district or reaching every community. The costs for staff and facilities, transport are shared, and it takes collaboration between these programmes and with departments of planning and financing to gather these estimates. Costing also needs to take into consideration the effectiveness of delivery mechanisms, which include not only coverage, but also timeliness, safety, and the different methods of delivering vaccines, such as fixed site, outreach, mobile, school-based, campaigns, or even child health days. As mentioned earlier, communities and the use of civil society is crucial when designing programmes to make sure the vaccines and their delivery are acceptable, appropriate and sustainable as they are taken up by the communities. There is an increasing wealth of evidence now being collected in various repositories that include communities of practice and various tools available at these two websites on the slide that are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Having gathered various estimates on costs, it is important to make budgets that can then be used to advocate for resources. This process is never a straightforward technical one and is often political in nature. The more evidence the process has, the more realistic the budgets can be. Policymakers also face the decision of whether new vaccines should be off budget, which helps free up more space on a health budget when negotiating with the Ministry of Finance, but longer term, when the country itself has to absorb all the costs, these may not be so obvious. Or, if new vac vaccines are on budget, the overall fiscal space for health is reduced, but more likely to be sustainable as the Ministry of Finance has a transparent and clear view of what the new vaccine investment actually means. Defining whether a new vaccine is affordable or not is important, especially when considering when expenditure on health is low. There are multiple competing priorities and when delivery of routine vaccines may be incomplete. To give an indication of the reality check that Ministry of Finances in middle and low income countries often face on the table on the right shows the average budget per capita for the whole health budget is between $37 and $92 per person. Remember how much it costs just for vaccines to fully immunize a boy or a girl with 11 or 12 antigens. These are obviously tough decisions. Many low and middle income countries face challenges when graduating or transitioning from global donor support. Two key donors in the immunization world are Gavi the Vaccine Alliance and the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Both have invested significant resources into vaccines and their delivery systems. Some would see it as a positive benefit of development that countries become more independent and reliant on their own resources. However, during this transition phase, there are several challenges that countries face. 
plans and budgets increasingly need to be discussed with broader health system planners and budget makers to ensure those shared costs are fully recognised. The country management of logistics and supplies needs to be continued as Gavi and polio funds decrease to ensure vaccines are delivered safely. Planning for new vaccine introductions need planned and budgeted for without Gavi support. More focus on domestic resource mobilisation and lastly, increasing ability of national institutions to increase their capacity to gather evidence, plan and implement effectively. Many low and middle income countries are undergoing transition planning processes just now. Once countries have made budgets for programmes, there is always a question of where will the money come from? And before going down this route, it's important for countries to ask several key questions highlighted here. Is the financing really additional? Is there a hidden cost to the new financing? Is the funding predictable and sustainable? How flexible is the financing? And will funds flow equitably, especially at subnational level? In terms of sources of new income for domestic resources, there are several sources that include ones highlighted here that include ongoing universal health coverage lobbying and advocating for 5% of GDP of all countries should be allocated for health. As vaccine prices are the main cost drivers of immunisation programmes, it pays dividends to try and find ways of reducing these costs. These include many pooled procurement mechanisms highlighted here, such as Gavi Vaccine Independence Initiative, accessing UNICEF prices or PAHO's revolving fund. Or another alternative actually to increase the domestic vaccine manufacturing capacity. However, it's not always about trying to find new money. It's also about trying to find efficiencies in existing programs and many resources can be saved by implementing key strategies such as decreasing wastage rates, decreasing dropout rates, integrating services at the point of delivery and increasing use of social mobilisation to increase demand. So, in summary, the way to strengthen new vaccine introduction includes involving national decision makers, using the evidence available about the burden of disease and other contexts and understanding the politics and dynamics of the situation. This will enable global policy to be translated into national action. And we can all encourage the introduction of new vaccines by reinforcing how vaccines play a role in the broader economy and that they have a very positive return on investment. In summary, to be effectively implemented, new vaccines should be integrated into current health care so that vaccine schedules can be optimal and opportunities to vaccinate aren't missed. Inequities between and within countries is becoming the major issue that requires careful links with delivery mechanisms if new vaccines are to reach their potential. Overcoming this will require implementing the Global Vaccine Action Plan and strengthening countries' delivery mechanisms and capitalising on new technologies. There remains a need to reinforce the alignment between immunisation and other global health agendas, such as the sustainability um, development goals and universal health care coverage, as this is the crucial link to potential political and financial commitment for sustainability, delivering more to more, and delivering along the life cycle. Thank you very much. At this time, we'd like to open the floor for questions. Please go ahead. Thank you. From our online audiences, Benjamin at Facebook. Has success been seen in addressing vaccine hesitancy through social media? And if so, can you speak to it some more? Uh, I'll go for this and maybe you can, you can add to this. Uh, I think there's been a lot of work done specifically in the European region, uh, where I also referred to that TIP tool, uh, where it was specifically uh, uh, work was specifically done in order to kind of find out what the social media are uh, speaking on, where the major topics come out, and then to have someone to actually respond to that in a scientifically sound but immediate action. Um, we don't yet have, I think, you know, a clear idea of 
whether this has resulted in less hesitancy, because hesitancy really is often not something that you can measure on the population level because it's focal. It is also not always hesitancy against everything related to vaccine, but maybe just hesitancy towards one particular vaccine or to see that, well, maybe we could have two vaccines instead of two in one. And so it's, it's a bit difficult to actually measure it, but I think there is quite some uh, interesting developments specifically in that region. may need to be a lot more nuanced than they have previously been. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for the excellent presentations. I had a question for um, Dr. Carson Mantel about, you talked about the urbanization, and to recognize that in Africa, we're talking now about the youth bulge, that there's going to be a large, um, looking at the pure animal of the, the population that we're going to see more and more in youth and as well the prediction of more than 85% um, in urban areas by the year of 2025, 20, 2030. So what are some of the strategies um, that you would think about in how to reach these populations and to reach these youth, uh, especially recognizing some of the situations that people are not being vaccinated now at the appropriate ages? Thank you. Great, and again, I think I'll, uh, I'll share the, the answer with uh, Craig, who just this morning had uh, presented a bit on this. Um, so I think there's, there is, first of all, really the acknowledgement that we have uh, a problem in urban areas uh, with reaching not only adolescents and youth, but also children, uh, because the services so far that we had put up are those in the rural areas where we have static centers and we have mobile clinics and we go out with uh, outreach services. And in urban areas, <coughs> specifically in those that are a bit more chaotic, uh, such as in the slum areas, we don't have these things in place yet. So a lot of more mobile services have been uh, put in place in uh, a number of, the, uh, of, of countries. There is a, a, an exercise of mapping out uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated, because again, we see this in, in foci, uh, not in across all uh, the urban area, but in specific areas, to also come up with determinants of non-vaccination, and then to come up with more targeted and tailored approaches to reach specific groups, um, either et ethnic populations or uh, people of specific backgrounds, with, again, targeted messages. So I think it's a, it's a not one-size-fits-all, again, but a really very difficult to grapple, but doable, tailored approach to specific populations. But Greg, you certainly have more to say than that. Thanks. A good, good question. Just four main thoughts. One was the issue of the denominator and estimating population is challenging. And actually uh, asking a fundamental question, do we, do we need a denominator to plan? Uh, may well be a fundamental issue. And the issue of kind of mobility on mobile populations of therefore the leading on from that is do we need to define a catchment area or not? And there are some that would argue, argue we don't need a catchment area, especially if we're going down the mobile um, unit uh, way. The second thought is there's a, there's a very different way of coordinating, no longer just directly with the Ministry of Health, it's with municipalities, sometimes it's unclear coordination, especially if populations have quasi-legal status, certainly in slums and may not be entitled to certain services. And therefore, it brings me on to my third thought, which is unusual contracting mechanisms with service providers such as NGOs or the private sector as well that can provide services uh, in a more kind of legally appetizing way. And then lastly, as Carson's highlighted, there may be some development of tools to better um, map out, identify, understand, and reach the specific community. So it's not necessarily a geographic approach. It's actually much more a community-based approach. Thanks. A question here. Again, from online audiences, Mohammed on Facebook asks, the community shows reluctance in giving more than two vaccines to a child at the same time. Do you think that vaccines need prioritization? Can you please repeat the question? Yes. The community shows reluctance in giving more than two vaccines to a child at the same time. Do you think that vaccines need prioritization? Mm -hmm. 
Well, as we discussed in the, the first slide, um, uh, in the first presentation, prioritization is dependent on a number of factors. Um, and with, uh, yes, uh, we have seen hesitancy um, and concern about vaccinating, uh, giving more than one or two or three shots at one time. Um, there's been uh, progress in uh, pooling vaccines together, multiple um, antigens in one uh, um, dose um, and one uh, in injection or shot, um, and that has uh, definitely uh, improved coverage. Um, and I'll let Dr. Mantel talk about uh, a bit more about prioritization. Um, maybe just to say that um, we are and have come across these um, issues of is it not too much uh, for my child to get two vaccines at the same time or even three vaccines at the same time? And I think uh, you know, there's uh, courageous uh, nurses who actually give even more uh, at, at the same time or two nurses doing this on the, on the same child at the same time. Um, we've. We, there was some research done, and there's publications on this here, also from uh, colleagues in, uh, at CDC, together with uh, WHO, where I was working before. And we saw that most of the hesitancy is actually from the side of the health workers, rather than from the mothers or the caretakers of the children. If they are asked, do you actually want to come back next week or in one month's time for the other shots, or do you want us to do it right away? most of them, 90%, 95% of them say, let's do it now. And uh, so it's more an, an education and behavior change approach towards health workers than towards the mothers and the caretakers. And I think that is encouraging again, as we are moving into a situation where we will have more vaccines given at the same time, nine months of age, 12 months of age, etc. we will have to deal with this issue going forward. Thank you for your presentations. Um, can you put into more context the different uh, components of the broad population gap in immunizations in terms of hesitancy, in terms of resources or technology? Um, it's hard to tell how big the hesitancy problem, for example, is and the, and the large gap in immunizations that we have. Yeah, uh, luckily enough, we do have uh, hesitancy not, as I said before, you know, across the board. We see smaller specific uh, populations in which this is uh, an issue, but we also see mainly in, and we were talking about low and middle income countries, uh, a lot of populations where this is not a problem at all. And I've been really going to countries and asking, is there not anything in this direction? And was told, no, we don't actually have any of this. Uh, and people who come to us, they demand the vaccine and they know the good of the vaccine. And this is specifically in areas where you still see cases of measles and you still see cases of tetanus. And once you've seen this, you will not even think about being hesitant about the vaccine. So I think this is one of the issues which distinguishes us here or in Europe or in other places from places where these vaccine-preventable diseases are still prevalent. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for excellent presentation from the speakers. And thank you for joining us in the audience. And we will see you next month for Public Health Grand Rounds.